Two Cosies was released earlier this week. Some of you might have heard of that game, or even played it yourself. But what most people don't know is, Zookosis is real, but not mutating animals. In fact, most of you had probably seen at least one form of Zookosis before, but you might not notice that it's abnormal. So, let me broad up the question. What exactly is Zookosis? By definition, Zookosis is stereotypical behavior by animals. Most of the time, captive animals. This definition might confuse some people, so let me explain it further. Stereotypical in this definition does not mean a generalized belief by people. Stereotypical in this case refers to repetitive action. This repetitive behavior is the one that have no real purpose. You'll recognize such behavior in humans a lot of the time, such as tapping feet, excessive scratching, teeth grinding, etc. If you are a card game player, you'll see someone excessively shuffles their hand. Those repetitive behavior is called stereotypy. You'll easily notice such behavior in humans because you yourself are humans. Now, let me ask you, what usually triggers such behavior? The answer is, well, many factors to be honest, but the most common one is anxiety, some kind of stress. The same applies to zookosis. By the way, zookosis is a combination of zoo and psychosis. So, to make it clearer, zookosis is abnormal repetitive behavior by animals caused by stress. Some propose that the action does not necessarily have to be repetitive. Anything that is functionless and tiresome can be categorized as zookotic behavior. While it doesn't necessarily have to be in captive animals, most of the time, that is indeed the case. Mind you, not just zoo, it includes pet being kept by people. That's also captive animal, you know. Okay, so, what are the forms of zookosis in animals? There are many, and of course, it varies between animal groups. The most common form is pacing. Animals can be observed walking around their enclosure over and over again, without any particular reason. This might be hard to spot unless you spend a lot of time observing them. One way to spot whether this is zookotic pacing or just them walking around is by observing their posture. If their walking posture looks weird, sometimes looking down all the time or even looking up, that's probably zookotic pacing. Sometimes, they can pace back and forth, moving forward and backward, which might look like an AI glitching in video games. In aquatic animals, they can swim along the outline of their enclosure. Aquatic animal keepers usually call this behavior glass surfing. Next is self-inflicted physical injury. The mildest example is excessive grooming, which is basically leaking themselves over and over again. Worst case is hair or feather plucking. Even worst case is self-biting, nibbling on themselves, or even banging their head against the wall or cage. Next is weaving or swaying. I've seen this often in elephants and bears. This is when they are somewhat standing in place while swaying left and right or back and forth. Some people might think they are dancing or just being silly, but in reality, they are stressed. This type of behavior that people might understand is when primates are doing this. They will do this rocking behavior, sitting, hugging their legs, and swaying back and forth. Humans do this too, so it's more relatable, I guess. Next is neck twisting. This one is when animals sway their neck backwards and roll their head. This one is more apparent in animals with longer neck like giraffe. Speaking of giraffe, they can also be seen licking the bars over and over again, even chewing the bars sometimes. That's also zookotic behavior. Those are the common yet obscure zookotic behaviors. Some are more obvious because it's somewhat extreme, like regurgitating and eating their own vomit, coprophagia and urophagia, shouting, and of course, aggression. If I ask you right now what causes zookosis, most of you watching to this point would probably know. It's caused by unsuitable environment. The most obvious factors is their enclosure. 
Enclosures should be able to support the animal's natural behavior. If the animal likes to roam, the enclosure should be larger. If the animal likes to climb, the enclosure should have more heights and stuffs to climb. If the animal likes to dig, the enclosure should have diggable substrate. If the animal likes to swim, the enclosure should have enough water body, etc. You get the point. The slightly more obscure factor is whether their feeding behavior can be done or not. Animals sometimes have niche food that they eat sometimes but not all the time for enrichment. This is often neglected by people. Not just the what, but the how. Some animals naturally forage for food by digging, looking inside tree holes, on top of trees, and stuff like that. This behavior should also be encouraged by providing foraging areas. Some specifically hunt during twilight, some during the night, and these should also be replicated as much as possible. There is also a social factor to consider. Some animals need to live with other individuals. Meanwhile, some are solitary. Then there's also a biotic factor, such as light, air, temperature, precipitation, humidity, etc. Most of these directly affect their physical health. But the one that often causes zoocosis is light. Nocturnal animals should be active during nighttime, where there is minimum light. That should be intuitive. Unfortunately, that condition is often not enforced in captive animals. Last one is the most obvious cause, but the one that is quite hard to change. It's human activity. This is especially prevalent in zoo with visitors. Just imagine. Having members of other species come and go and watch you most of the time is weird enough. Now remember, some people do bad stuff to these animals. Pretty sure you'll see bad behavior by visitors at least one in the news or social media. Now, even if the human itself is not visible, the sign of humans can still be sensed by captive animals. The most disruptive one is urban noises. If these captive animals are located in busy area, there could be industrial noises, sounds from speakers, loud vehicles, and stuff like that. Some people are also annoyed by these sounds. Now imagine animals. Now, this loops back to the enclosure factors. In the wild, animals can move away from disturbance or threat. Maybe hide somewhere calm. Captive animals often cannot do that because they are not given the proper hiding place. Now, let's talk about how to mitigate zoocosis. But before that... In my opinion, the first thing you have to do before even deciding to keep an animal is to research said animals. Dig as much information as you can. Their behavior, their living conditions, stuff like that. Then, you prepare an enclosure that can support such behavior. If you cannot, then don't keep said animal. Quite simple, right? I would also suggest factoring whether there are vets that can take care of said animals or not. Big zoos usually have dedicated vets with sufficient expertise, but perhaps not for small zoos. If you are just an individual trying to keep animals, then this should also be your consideration. Are there vets in your area that can take care of said animals? Oh, by the way, if you didn't know, vets are not trained to be an expert in every single animal groups. Common pets like cats and dogs are usually alright, but more niche and exotic pets are not. Exotic pets include reptiles and amphibians, by the way. Just clarifying because it's becoming more and more common as pets nowadays. Anyway, I already talked about the causes of zoocosis in the previous section, right? To keep this video relatively short, I'm just gonna say, make sure those don't happen. I'm especially gonna emphasize on a place to retreat. Make sure they have some places to retreat and hide. That's very important. Also, give them some enrichment, like toys to play, rubbing or scratching surfaces, and sense, aka olfactory enrichments. And this is one of the things that most neglects. Varieties. Make sure to rotate what you gave them. Don't give them the same food the entirety of their life. Same with other enrichments. Rotate the toys you gave them so they don't get bored. At the very least, 
rearrange them so it's not the exact same thing in the exact same place forever. Let's talk about the effect of zoocosis on animals. The most obvious one is probably a direct health damage. Some zoocodic behaviors are physically harmful. The decline of psychological health could also lead to decline of physical health. If ignored, animals will refuse to eat, they will become lethargic, they begin to cease function, and then they die. The opposite spectrum could also happen. They become very aggressive, attacking other individuals, attacking keepers, and possibly even visitors. When you think about it, it's basically the same thing that happens when humans are stressed, right? Alright, if you've been watching this video up to this point, you might be wondering, what exactly is the problem? Everything sounds very intuitive. Why don't they just provide a proper environment for the animals? Well, there are several factors. The first one is lack of knowledge. To put it simply, we don't know everything about animals. Just imagine, we are still discovering more things about humans and that's our own species. We are still trying to learn more about these animals, of course. That's why zoologists exist. But there are several problems that inhibit our progress. That's an entirely different topic, though. The point is, we don't know everything, so we are not entirely sure what to do for captive animals. In some cases, we do have the knowledge, but the people that actually have the rights to do something don't. Academics do the research, we publish the results of our research, but it's basically useless if people don't read said research. And this is very common, even for veteran keepers. Just try asking people that have been keeping snakes for a long time. How many of those people are aware that snakes enclosure should be at least as long as the snake's length? I've seen this over and over again, where people keep animals in a tiny enclosure. It's especially prevalent for those who keep reptiles and amphibians because those are thought to be cold-blooded sedentary animals. People don't know about their behavior. We couldn't exactly judge their reaction because they are not very expressive. And this is not exclusive to these animals. This is also prevalent in more expressive animals even. I've seen a video of cat panting, and the comments are just saying how cute it looks, how happy it is, and stuff like that. Meanwhile, the cat is actually suffering. Might even be abused by its owner for content. Who knows? That is cat, which is the animal we are most familiar with, basically. Think about other animals. So yeah, not knowing and misunderstanding is more prevalent than you might think. While not knowing is already bad enough, there is a next level to this problem. People who refuse to know. I've seen this case over and over again where keepers and breeders refuse to hear what others say. Most of the time, it's ego. You know, they've been doing this for 10 years or maybe 20 years or whatever the number is. Surely they know more about these animals. That's what they think at least. Same with pet keepers. I've heard some vets complain about owners refusing to listen, saying, Oh no, my baby is happy, or whatever it is. I've even saw someone debating a vet and even stating the vet doesn't know what he is talking about, while the vet has literally worked on actual wild animals in the literal natural habitat and even still providing references for his explanation. This kind of stuff is very common in our field. Now, of course, I am an academic. So I definitely won't encourage you to trust whatever a person in charge said. You should keep a healthy amount of skepticism, because everyone can be wrong. Again, we don't know everything about, well, anything basically. But what you should do with that skepticism is, fact check them. Including me, of course. Fact check me. Fact check yourself too. And fact check your sources too. Science is built on prior knowledge. It keeps evolving, so fact-checking every now and then is important, especially if you are the person in charge. Other challenges, they simply cannot provide. They couldn't afford to. Maybe they don't have the resources, the budget, logistic problem, etc. But in my personal opinion, 
if you cannot provide a proper environment even if you know what it should be, then don't keep said animal. Simple. That's if your mindset is on animal welfare though. The most problematic challenge in my opinion is if the mindset is not on animal welfare. You know, purely for monetary reason or personal gain, whatever. Just providing the bare minimum requirements so the animals can barely stay alive. Then there is the unpredictable challenge, which is humans. In zoos, it would be visitors. For pet keepers, it could be visiting family members, friends, or whoever. If you would ask me what my ideal zoo would be, it would be a zoo built in a somewhat secluded place, and I wouldn't let any visitors in. I would just install cameras so people could just see the animals through some streams. One for its enclosure. That is most likely not sustainable monetary-wise, of course, I understand. But maybe someday, you know, for the sake of animal welfare, education, and conservation, maybe such zoo can exist in an ideal world. Talking about this reminds me of that moment when my friend went to the zoo and said, why is this enclosure worse than what I created on Planet Zoo? That remark was kinda funny to me. It's a lot easier in Planet Zoo, of course, since you are given the direction and parameters of what to fulfill for these animals. You don't really need to think about monetary risk, logistics, and stuff like that. But still, it's quite a shame that some random person knows more about animal welfare and the enrichment requirement for these animals than the actual keeper in real life. So for now, let's just learn what is known. And that's all for now. Oh, by the way, the zoo cozy's game itself is quite fun for me, I guess. What's funny is that it actually shows a nicely designed enclosure, better than most of the zoo I have been to. Anyway, enjoy your day.